Jay Warner Wallace is a cold case homicide detective who's been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Dateline, and Court TV. Now, we join him as he applies his investigative skills to making a case for Christianity. Thanks for joining us at Cold Case Christianity. I'm Jay Warner Wallace. Tonight we're going to be talking about uh, one chapter from my new book, Person of Interest. You can learn more about that at personofinterestbook.com. And we're going to be talking about the impact and the fallout in culture that Jesus and his followers had on the sciences. For those people who might say, well, Jesus really has, you know, Christians don't have any impact on the sciences, or that somehow Christianity is by its very nature anti-science, take a look at this presentation, which I did with Brett Kunkel at maventruth.com. I apologize for some of the audio on this. This was an internet presentation, but I think it's clear enough for you to be able to hear the case uh, for Christianity through the sciences. So when I see things like this kind of a tweet, oh, 1,500 years ahead if it hadn't been for the church dragging science back by its coattails and burning our best minds at the stake, I'm thinking they don't really understand the history of Galileo all that well. And this is really just kind of quoting a, a, a social activist named Catherine Farringer who first said this kind of thing. Now, I think the question here is, what do we mean when we use this term, science? What do we mean by that? Now, remember, I told you that word was not available to the ancients. They called it natural philosophy. As a matter of fact, they didn't have the tools in which to investigate the world around. They didn't have telescopes and microscopes. They would just think about these ideas philosophically. And thinking about the natural world around you is called natural philosophy in the ancient, to the ancients. But today, when we think about science, we think about it as it's defined as the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. And scientists are people who do, scientists are people who systematically gather and use research, right, and evidence to make a hypothesis. You later test, and then you share this understanding and knowledge. So when it comes to this kind of definition of science, I want to take you back in time. Here's a timeline. Uh, we'll start with way back when, uh, 2,000 years before the birth of, of Jesus, and we'll end up right now, 2,020 years after the birth of Jesus. Where do scientists, where do they emerge? I think this is fascinating to look at. But for example, the, the earliest placement of kind of foundational things related to mathematics, that is pretty ancient, happening many thousands of years ago. And we have evidence of that both in tablets and in papyrus. And then we have kind of a small trickle of scientific thinkers in antiquity, uh, people like uh, Aristotle, people who, you know, like Ptolemy, people who show up and, 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 and examine the natural world around them. And then we see a small growth, like a kind of a bump of activity. And then we see a, a kind of a big uh, jump of, of activity. And, and, and then you see another step of activity, if you look at the dating on it. I just did this by, by examining all of the known scientists historically. And then you see something wild you see an explosion of activity. This explosion from 1500 to 1700 AD is known as the scientific revolution right here. Now, when I'm fascinated by this, this is the kind of the chart of, of, of scientists time. And what I'm interested in is where does Jesus fall in this sequence? Well, it turns out that Jesus falls right here. Okay. Now, now my question for you is this. Why is the explosion of scientific thinking on the right side of Jesus rather than the left? I mean, I don't know what's available. It's not like the materials weren't available, that people weren't smart enough. If you read Aristotle, you realize he's a pretty smart guy. So it's not like people were smart. Why is it on the right side? It could easily, for example, have occurred over here. Why didn't it? Why didn't all this ex explosion of, of, of interest in science and, and the natural realm occur over here? Is there something to the person of Jesus, to the Christian worldview, that is central to the explosion of science? I think there is, mostly because this, this idea of the scientist is a direct descendant of what is really known today as the Christian monk, the medieval Christian monk. And it's been said many times that what made it possible for science to emerge in the human race in the first time in the first place, is its insistence, the medieval insistence of Christians that God is rational. As a matter of fact, 
Dinesh D'Souza puts it this way, science as an organized, sustained enterprise arose only once in human history, and that was in Europe in the civilization then called Christendom. Why? What is it about Christianity that triggers, that ignites an explosion in scientific interest? Well, let's go back to our chart for a second. This first little bump here you see where it starts to rise, what is causing that? Well, I can tell you this. One thing for sure, it's happening right around the Roman edicts of Milan and of Thessalonica, which legalized Christianity in the empire and made it the religion of the empire. And after that happens, you start to see a rise in scientific thinking. Interesting. Uh, there's another little rise here next to it. Uh, you can barely see it, but what is that? Well, this is when the cathedral and monastery schools are being established. This is very early in history. And the cathedral schools are, this, are just schools that are attached to cathedrals. <laughs> Pretty easy to figure that out. And monasteries are places where people actually collected uh, information, both, both secular and both Christian and non-Christian information, and taught it to people who attended the monasteries. So these are the forerunners of all higher education. Now, what about this little bump right here? Now, there are many more Christians, and I'll show you later, that kind of emerge here, but this is what I call the Muslim bump, because it turns out in the Middle Ages, Muslims were very involved in the sciences, but it ends. And Muslims today are not as involved in the sciences as they were in the Middle Ages. Why? Well, it's been a lot of speculation about that. There's a book called The Closing of the Muslim Mind that kind of tries to explore why that happened. I have my views as well. You can ask in the Q&A. What is this over here? Why do we see a bump here in history? Well, this is when the first universities founded by Christians in Bologna, Cambridge, uh, Paris, these emerge. And now we have a place in which to do science. And what is causing this bump? Well, this bump just happens to be right around the printing press. And what is causing this explosion, this utter explosion? Well, it does happen to be ha occurring with the Reformation. And now we have no centralized authority, which is kind of like saying, hey, uh, you can only think a certain way on some of these issues. It's, it's wide open uh, to interpretation. And it turns out that these people here in the scientific revolution are largely, uh, uh, dramatically Christian. This is a Christian reformation. This is a Christian uh, revolution in science. Christianity had a huge oversized impact on science. Why? Christianity is not anti-science. Christianity uh, initiates much of the scientific thought uh, of all human beings. Why would that be the case? Well, there's a couple of things I think actually ignite this kind of thinking amongst Christians. The first is that, that Christ followers, unlike, say, like Plato, Christ followers believe that matter is not uh, bad. Uh, early th philosophical thinkers saw matter, the material world, as evil, fallen, dirty not worthy of actually consideration. They put their thoughts on, on higher things that were not material. But if that's the case, are you really going to examine material matter from a scientific perspective? It's not until you realize that believe that matter is good that you think it's even worthy of study. So that's an igniter that ignites science in the, in the ancients. Also, I want you to look at these paintings of the pantheon of gods that preceded Jesus. They're almost always painted like this. The debauchery, I, by the way, I have put clothes on most of these guys, okay, because when the painting itself, that they don't, they don't have clothes. They're all naked, running around, and the ancient gods of this, uh, they're always chasing after women. They're killing humans in order to compete for women. They're getting drunk all the time and doing stupid things while they're drunk. This is how they're painted, because this is pretty much what the pantheon of gods was like. And by the way, if you think that, that gods are responsible for what's happening in the world around us, but they're all a bunch of drunken, you know, uh, treacherous uh, characters, are you really going to, why should I study uh, science? I mean, what, if the gods are responsible for this and they're all willy-nilly, then I would expect I'm not going to be able to figure out what's going on in the scientific world. But if you're worshiping a god who instead is a, is a singular, singular, orderly, rational god, well, now you've got a reason why you might want to study his singularly, orderly, rational environment that he created, his world. And by the way, if you think the gods are simply in the, the actual things you're studying, so uh, lightning is a result of the decisions made by Zeus, who is the god of lightning, and the waves move a certain way because of the decisions that are being made by Poseidon, well, how are you really going to discover that? Like, there's no sense to it. It's just the, the, whatever the will of that god is. But Christ followers believe that God was separate from his creation. 
That key difference means that I could study the behavior of these things that God sets into motion without thinking that God just changed his mind today and was mad at us, so he threw a lightning bolt at us. Also, if you think about some of the professors you may have engaged in in, in high school or I, I, I certainly did in college, a lot of folks doing science in these who are not believers, they're not Christ followers, they don't believe in any God, but they still have a passion for numbers, let's say. And they want to pursue and puzzle and figure out what the numerical relationships are. That's, that would drive me, I think, to a certain extent. But imagine if the numbers are more than just numbers. This is what Johannes Kepler, who's the father of modern science, his view is that it's not just about numbers and physics. When we're doing science, we're actually discovering the mind of God. He said it this way, I was merely thinking God's thoughts after him. And since we astronomers are priests of the highest God in regard to the book of nature, it benefits us to be thoughtful, not of the glory of our minds, but rather above all else of the glory of God. And this becomes an igniter for science because Christ followers saw this as an act of worship. They were motivated by their desire to understand God's thoughts. That's crazy, right? That's what you're doing when you do science. Now, you'll notice that in the Gospels, there are some missing stuff. <laughs> now, the Gospels don't con contain everything. For example, if you look at the Gospel of Mark, it only has 678 verses. It's missing a lot of stuff you'll find in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew is missing stuff that's found in the Gospel of Luke. And John is missing a bunch of stuff. As a matter of fact, John the Apostle told us it's missing a bunch of stuff because he said there are so much other things, so many other things that Jesus said and did, that if they were written in detail, the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. So let's go back to Galileo for, for a second. That's something different. That's called natural revelation. It, it turns out that these two forms of revelation are slightly different. One is from the book of Scripture. One is from the book of nature. So this is interesting. Scientists actually get to discover something that's pretty profound. Paul, Paul puts it this way, the Apostle Paul. He puts it this way. He says, okay, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. Paul is describing the book of nature, the natural revelation of the world around us. King David also described this in Psalm 19. He said it this way, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Yet they have no speech and they don't use words. No sound is heard from them. Well, wait a minute. If there's no words, how do we know what is being said in this book? Well, here's how we know. We get to investigate it so we can discover the words of the book of nature through science. And this has been done by scientists throughout the years. This is Werner von Braun, who is the reason why we travel in space. He is the father of modern space flight. He's a Christian. Here's how he said it. He said, although I know of no reference to Christ ever commenting on scientific work, I do know that he said, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Thus, I'm certain that were he among us today, Christ would encourage scientific research as modern man's most noble striving to comprehend and admire his father's handiwork. Here's my point. Christ's followers believed that they could actually write in the information, the data, discover it, and communicate the data that's missing from the book of nature by simply doing science. And they did it robustly. They got their hands dirty. Why? Because remember, universities came out of the monasteries. And in monasteries, people got their fingers dirty. They got their hands in the dirt, digging up stuff. They were, they were workers in the monasteries as well as thinkers. So unsurprisingly, when it came time to study human anatomy, for example, the first dissections were done in Christian universities by people who came from a tradition of pursuing both their physical and intellectual investigations. They weren't afraid to touch stuff. Finally, on this, I think it's interesting. This is another igniter. This is a painting from the first college, first university at Bologna. Somebody actually painted what it looked like in the first university. You can tell it's a university because right here, you've got a typical university college student, right? Things haven't changed all that much, falling asleep during the lecture. But this is what the actual university looks like in Bologna today. It's still there. It turns out that Christ followers also had an advantage because they created the place where science was done. So let's go back to our, our chart. There's a reason why it explodes after Jesus, because of all those igniters. Those igniters are the things that got science kick-started and resulted in an oversized impact on science. Christianity has had, and when I say oversized, I mean 
oversized. I'm going to show you some stuff right now. And what I'm about to show you is just the tip of the scientific iceberg. And there's a bunch of stuff below the surface level that, 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 that I'm not going to be able to show you because these folks, all the people I'm going to show you are just the tip of the scientific iceberg related to scientists. Uh, in essence, I'm going to show you the hall of fame of Christians who did science and are still doing science. And I'm not going to be able to show you all of this stuff. These are the also-rans. These are the people who are the unsung heroes, the unsung scientists who I'm not going to show you today. Remember, we go back to Jesus and the kind of impact he's had on culture. Here's the blast radius that Jesus creates. I'm going to turn this into a hall of fame for scientists. And here it is. This is what science looked like in antiquity amongst Christians. Even in the most ancient period, Christians were doing science. As a matter of fact, one of these Christians doing science, named John Philoponus, is what he's known today as the father of the modern Kalam cosmological argument. You may have heard the cosmological argument. It starts in antiquity, and the father of the modern version of that argument is a Christian. Let's go to the Dark Ages. You know, it turns out the Dark Ages were not that dark in terms of scientific thinking related to Christians. These are the tip of the iceberg, the heroes, the, the, the hall of fame. And uh, three of them actually are considered fathers of certain scientific disciplines. If you go to the Middle Ages, guess what happens? It gets just even more crowded. These are the um, uh, hall of fame, uh, the, the tip of the iceberg of science, uh, scientists who are Christians in the Middle Ages. And a bunch of these are fathers of important disciplines like geometry, like physiology, even the modern thinking about modern epistemology. Let's go to the early Renaissance period. Now, this is the period in which you expect to see a little more activity, and sure enough, there are more Christians doing science in this period, and a bunch more that actually initiate scientific dis uh, disciplines. The father of, a, of, of, of pathological anatomy, of zoology, of, 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 of medicine, meteorology, of botany, of toxicology, physiology, they're all even the father of surgery, these are Christians. Now, what's interesting is we're now going to leave uh, more ancient times and just turn the corner to what is known as the scientific revolution. I want you to see the number of Christians who in just 200 years changed the history of science because there are a few. This is the tip of the scientific iceberg during the scientific revolution. Now, I don't know if you're seeing what I'm seeing. I'm seeing some kind of interesting things here. I'm seeing, for example, these four right here are clearly, uh, this is a precursor. These are, this is like a, a 70s rock band, if you ask me. Okay, that's, that's like the father of 70s rock, but I'm not sure what they actually played in terms of music. But let's go back to our group for a second. These are the fathers of disciplines. And I'm getting, it's going to be hard to put all of their names on here even and all of their, their disciplines because they're getting so tiny. But I just wanted you to see that we have a large number of scientific uh, categories that are initiated by Christians. And now they're also starting to give each other awards. And these awards are not reserved for just Christians. Although the first scientific societies were founded largely by Christians and dominated by Christians because the Christians dominate the science. Now, though, we're going to go into a period of time that Darwin lived in, post-scientific revolution. I mean, Darwin wrote the book, you know, Origin of Species. I mean, surely he, he suggested there's no need for a God hypothesis. We can explain how we got here and how things change over time just with natural um, forces, right, and, and natural selection. So I would expect in this period of time, post-Darwin, there'll be less. There'll be less people there that are Christians who are doing this work because the God hypothesis has been damaged, hasn't it, by Darwin? And eh, wrong. The tip of the scientific iceberg in the late modern period is far more crowded. As a matter of fact, a bunch of these contributed to evolution and thinking about evolution. Uh, they weren't unaware of evolution. They didn't stop doing science because some guy says evolution is true. And I don't believe evolution is supported by the facts, but a lot of these folks actually did. These are people who are in certain disciplines, and like this guy, William uh, Williams Keene, they would say, no, I believe in God, and I believe in evolution at the same time. Now, there's some people today who still uh, would hold that same position. I'm not one of those, but I wanted to show you that the father of evolutionism and the father of evolution is not Darwin. It's Christians who are doing the science in the top here, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. So let's go back to our, our, sci our, our fathers of certain disciplines. There's a ton here. I can't even write them all on here. You wouldn't be able to read them, but I will tell you this. We have people who initiated 
work in evolution who are Christians. Also, you can't do science without mathematics, and the fathers of all the mathematical disciplines, algebra to geometry to trigonometry to calculus, they're all Christians. And even the outcomes of logarithms and different sequences, they're all Christians. You can't, do, uh, you can't do science without the philosophy of science, and it turns out the fathers of the philosophy of science, guess what? They are all Christians. You, you, even the scientific disciplines themselves founded by Christians. You want to talk about physics, modern theoretical atomic physics? These are all founded by Christians. How about astronomy, um, cosmology, astrophysics, founded by Christians? How about biology and every subset of biology, founded by Christians? How about chemistry as we know it today, founded by Christians? How about anatomy and, and physiology? Christians. Uh, how about oceanography and meteorology and all the mechanics, like quantum mechanics? By the way, do any of you, I'm not suggesting you watch this, but some of you already have, Breaking Bad, all right? Breaking Bad, the main character here is a high school chemistry teacher who decides to start cooking methamphetamine. His name is Walter White, but he had a, a street name he used with all the drug dealers. He called himself Heisenberg. Well, where's he getting that from? Well, because he's, quote, he, 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 Heisenberg was a co-father of quantum mechanics, and his name was Werner Heisenberg, and he's a Christian. The highest levels, zoology, entomology, botany, all of these things founded by Christians. Um, look at the, you know, uh, archaeology and, and, and you, you name it, it was founded by a Christian. And by the way, all the local regional stuff in each country led by Christians. All the medical disciplines from, you name it, uh, serology, surgery, the maker of the x-ray, the MRI, even the, the manner in which we study cancer, the somatic mutation theory of carcinogenesis, that is from a Christian. And if you like to drive, or have you ever flown in a plane, you can make a Christian because this is the father of the engines, automobile, basic flying, aeronautics, and space flight. You like to use your, like, your computer right now? Well, you need electricity to do that. And guess who's responsible for electricity? Christians. Oh, your computer you're using? Guess who's responsible for that? Christians, including language. Uh, oh, how about your phone? All the engineering stuff, all this stuff we've done, and a bunch of cool stuff you would expect from scientists, right? Like, for example, you know, PVC and hydrogen peroxide and barometers and spectrometers, all that stuff created by Christians. And by the way, you had a calendar that told you to get here today. Well, you can thank a Christian for that calendar. And you like dessert. I like dessert. Well, you can thank a Christian for that, too. Uh, how many you ever put honey on your bread, uh, your toast? Uh, you can thank a Christian for that. Um, you, you ever, like, want to get a steak? Well, you can thank a Christian for that. Um, let's see. Have you ever thought about like parachuting out of a plane? Uh, you can thank a Christian for that. Uh, have you ever seen this movie, uh, the 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 Hunt for for Red October, or any other movie involving a submarine? There's some cool submarine movies out there, right? Well, you can thank a Christian for that. Now, I'm not sure what to say about this, uh, but if, if you ever needed it, uh, uh, you can thank a Christian for it. Okay. And, and finally, if you like to fly fish, you can thank a Christian for that. Here's my point. Christ's followers initiated every major scientific field of study and created a lot of cool stuff along the way. And as we're wrapping this up, I want to show you that this is all of the uh, scientific revolution guys. A bunch of them are medal winners. They are medal winners in all of these crazy, important, top-notch medals that are given to scientists. These are the leading medals that are given to scientists around the world today, and Christians have won all of them repeatedly. And you know, I mean, I recognize some of these. I don't recognize all of these either. I recognize the last one on this list, the Nobel Prize. Oh, by the way, the Nobel Prize, it looks like this. And if you actually research this, you'll discover that Nobel Prize has been won. Uh, this is the most recent research on this by a number of different groups. You might think that atheists own this. Actually, atheists are responsible for about 10% of Nobel Prize winners by this chart. And a bunch of other groups are represented here. Uh, this is all Jewish scientists. And what do you think that big blue section is? Yep, you got it. These are Christ followers. Christ followers initiated every major branch of science and have outperformed every other group. So finally, when someone says this to you, you know, science is the source of all truth in my view. And I really trust scientists more than anyone else. I think I can understand why someone might say that. So if we go back to the history, right, of, of the... Um, of, of the church. There are a bunch of people called the church fathers, and these guys all wrote about Jesus. They told us something about Jesus. But I don't trust these folks because I only trust scientists. These are theologians. Okay, fine. Let's go back to our uh, fathers of science, and let's add all the fathers from the pre-scientific uh, revolution. So these are the, the science fathers. 
And these science fathers also tell us something about Jesus. Here's what I did. I went back and I read all of the science fathers to see if they ever wrote anything about Jesus. And then I made a summary of everything you could learn about Jesus if there was no Christian scripture and all you had were the scientists over history and what they said about Jesus. You could reconstruct the entire life of Jesus from his earliest days on planet Earth. You could reconstruct all of the details of his miraculous birth. You could reconstruct the teaching of Jesus. And a lot of the, I mean, this is as much as you find in scripture. You could, how about the statements? Oh my gosh, every, these people quote Jesus over and over and over again as scientists writing on other, other areas of their life. And you could reconstruct the statements of Jesus just, now I'm not expecting to read all these, okay? I'm just going to show you the depth of what you could reconstruct. Everything about Jesus' ministry, everything about Jesus' mission and what he was to do, even the theological principles related to his mission and how he forgives sin, for example, and purges us of our sin. All of this stuff can be reconstructed from scientists, okay? The preaching of Jesus, where he preached, all right? His interaction with people he knew, like John the Baptist. Everything you want about his followers and who they were, what their names were, what did he do with his followers how did he interact with them that from the science fathers as well well get this the fathers of science did not deny the miraculous claims of jesus they believed in science and all the natural processes but they also believed in the miracles of jesus all of the miracles of jesus they believed he was god they believed in the, the, the duality of jesus they gave him the same titles that are given in scripture Scripture, and they repeated everything about the crucifixion of Jesus, every detail of the crucifixion, and everything about the resurrection. Here's my point. There is virtually nothing you know about Jesus that if you had every piece of, of, of Christian scripture burned, you could reconstruct it with the science fathers, because the science fathers agree with the church fathers. So next time someone says to you, I trust scientists more than anyone else, Say, do you think I trust what they say about Jesus? Well, there you have it. The huge impact that Jesus and his followers had on the sciences. Just one chapter of the fallout in our book, Person of Interest. You can find out more at personofinterestbook.com. I think this huge impact that Jesus has on culture is just more evidence of his deity. Think about that. And I'll see you right here next week at Cold Case Christianity. To hear more from Jay Warner Wallace, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For more information on this week's topic, visit youtube.com slash coldcasechristianity with Jay Warner Wallace. Thank you for joining us on this Cold Case Christianity broadcast.